Good morning and welcome to Crossroads Church. Whether you are in person or joining us online, we are thrilled to have you worshiping with us this morning. You know, throughout scripture, we are reminded that God's mercies are new every morning. So no matter what you've been walking through, if you've been enjoying the glorious sunshine and the hot weather, or if you've been walking through some things that have been a little bit harder, we know that our God is faithful and we know that our God is with us. So I just invite you this morning to join us to worship. If you are here in person or if you're in your living room, go ahead and stand up and join us as we worship together. Thank you. 
Lord, we do come here to worship you. For you do make beautiful things out of our messes, out of our mistakes, out of circumstances beyond of our control. And you have made all things. And you have made us to be in a relationship with you and with others. But sometimes those relationships feel broken. That makes us want to fight. And sometimes we fight you. Sometimes we fight each other. But what we really need to do is surrender. Surrender to your will. So right now, Lord, we surrender our wills and our lives to your care and control. We seek your guidance in our lives. We don't want to keep living our way. We want to live your way. So teach us now, Lord. We surrender. We surrender to you.
Pastor Gordon. Good morning, everyone. Today we actually have two stories. Uh, first of all, one may, it might be true, who knows. Debbie's family was rushing around getting ready to go to the ball game when her mother said, hang on a minute, I need to touch up my hair. Everyone sighed and sat down while the mother entered the bathroom. The next day, Debbie saw her friend Katie in the hall at the school. They smiled and said hi, and each went on their way. Debbie thought about how once they had been best friends, but lately they kind of drifted apart. It made Debbie feel sad. She missed her close friendship. Then she thought about her mother's statement that night before, about touching up her hair, and she knew that she had to touch up her relationship with Katie. After class, she found Katie and invited her to watch a movie together. To her surprise, Katie said, I'm so glad you asked. I miss spending time with you. It might be true. Who knows? We know it's true. It's in the Bible. When Joseph was young, his brothers were jealous of him, so they did something terrible. They sold him. Joseph ended up as a slave in Egypt. But God was with him. Eventually, Joseph rose to a powerful position. In fact, after interpreting Pharaoh's dream, Joseph was put in charge of overseeing their food supplies. There was a famine in the land. It was so severe, people came from all over to see Joseph for food. Then one day, Joseph's brothers arrived. Eventually, Joseph couldn't take it anymore. He had to let them know who he was. We pick up the story in Genesis 45, verses 4 through 9. You have your Bibles? We'll read together. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one that you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years, now there has been a famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was, not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all the Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. Joseph had every reason to cut off relationships with his brothers, just look at what happened to him. When his brothers came begging him for food, he could have sent them on their way, empty-handed. But why? To have again a good relationship with his family. We know it's true. It's in the Bible. Thank you, Randy, and thank you, Ruth, for uh, writing our stories for us. Have any of you ever felt like selling your little brother? <laughs> there are a few nods. <laughs> All right, I promise I won't use you as a sermon illustration. <laughs> you know, as pastors, sometimes we have this wonderful pleasure of putting our sermons into practice before we preach them. Amen. <laughs> And uh, when you're doing the Fixer Upper series, uh, maybe that's not such a great idea. <laughs> it's been one of those weeks. And like many of you, I have been working on an endless, li endless, endless list of tasks that I wanted to get done before the summer would come, right? Like I decided to open up my mouth last year with the above ground swimming pool and I said to the kids, hey kids, wouldn't it be great if we 
built a water slide in these trees here. A, a water slide that would drop into the pool, and, and now I'm on the hook to get this done, and Teresa has it in her head that the pool's going to be set up for her birthday at May 23rd, and so I'm scrambling, the kids are helping me paint, we're pulling it all together, we can show the other projects, and finally, I'm getting it done. They're anxious, it's like only 60 degrees out that day, but they wanted to get into the 50 degree water for like two minutes. And eventually we got things up and running just in time for the summer heat, right? And the kids can enjoy sliding down the slide. So there was the pool project that I needed to finish up. And then, of course, I needed to get my garden in. And I started everything by seed, and I was waiting to get the garden in until I could get the, the tiller fixed because it's really hard soil that hadn't been worked before last year. And it turns out that last year when I tilled up the garden, I decided to break the, the garden tiller by grinding off some teeth and one of the gears, and so the propellers weren't really going, and so then I'm doing it by hand, and I'm taking the, the tiller apart and trying to put that together, and I finally gave up. And, and then there was the bath handle, and the master bath decided to break, which when that breaks, it means you can't actually turn off the water fully. And for those of you that live in Elko New Market, you know that with $150 water bills, you don't really want that water to continually run. And so like, okay, now I gotta fix the water bath faucet. And then as I'm doing that, apparently the dog tried to get out of the screen door. Now the screen door is knocked out of its, its slider and it's, it literally will not open. And it's like one project after another project. And finally I reach my boiling point. I reach my point of frustration. And I'm stomping around the house going, I'm tired of fixing things. I just want to do the job I actually get paid to do, right? <laughs> All right, it's been one of those weeks. And sometimes we get in that spot, right, where it feels like we are moving backwards instead of forwards. And so I said that to Melissa, I'm just kind of tired of working on these problems. I'm tired of fixing everything. It's to which she responded, it seems like you have plenty of certain illustrations. <laughs> I guess she was right. It can be hard to notice the progress you are making when you are buried underneath a growing list, when you are in the middle of a touch-up, isn't it? When you have all these projects to do, it's easy to become overwhelmed, buried underneath all that list, and it can become discouraging. We can feel like giving up, we can feel like check it out, or just put it in off to another day, or maybe I've been known to do this from time to time, just look for the quickest, easiest, fastest, cheapest solution. Which usually means you just repeat that process over and over again, doesn't it? Because you didn't fix it right the first time. And it doesn't take long before we're right back at it, making the same repairs over and over again. Can anyone relate? Anyone else have a project like mine? Yeah. We all have been there. We all have our list of things that we want to get done. And in order to to get to the place where we want to be, right? But when it seems like we are moving backwards, when we can't see the progress we are making, sometimes it's tempting to just check out, to give up, walk away. <laughs> let's ignore the fact that the pool's leaking and we have to fix up. You know? Like, let's just ignore some of those problems, we'll deal with it later, right? We can kind of check out. It can be hard to see the progress we are making when we are in the middle of a messy meeting. We're in the middle of the mess of our lives, but that doesn't mean we need to give up in the middle of the mess. You know, maybe you're here today, and nobody knows it, but you're buried by an ever-growing list, right? It seems like you, you wonder, will you ever get to where you want to be? The, the home you are in now is not how you imagined it would have been. And, and things are, are a little stressful. You wonder, will things ever change? Will it always be like this, right? When will the other person ever, ever change? Will we, things ever get much better? How much longer can we hang out to this relationship? How much more energy can we pour into fixing something when we don't see any results? No one knows this, but it feels like you're just barely getting by. And sometimes we're just hanging on by a thread, aren't we? We feel it empty inside. Well, if that's you today, then it's probably time for a touch-up, is it? But we all can use a fresh coat of paint. It's time to make a repair. It's time to fill our lives, our relationships, our space with the things that bring us life, the things that bring us hope, the things that energize us and restore us again. In Matthew chapter 12, 
Jesus encounters a man who is possessed by a demon. And this demon had left him blind and mute. Now, if you think about that, this condition likely suffered him from the rest of the community. There was no way for him to communicate. He was isolated and alone, completely dependent upon others. We don't know much about this man's story. Jesus doesn't really tell us a whole lot of the background. But one day, this man encounters Jesus. And when he does, his life is completely changed. Because in a powerful moment of healing and transformation, Jesus cast out this demon, enabling the man to speak and to see again, restoring him to the community. It was a miracle, and all those who witnessed it were amazed by this great thing that Jesus had done. He says all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? You see, they saw something in Jesus that gave them hope. They recognized a power and authority in him that they had not seen before. And even the demons would obey Jesus. Surely he was the one they were waiting for. But not everyone was so excited about what Jesus had done. Some people were a little skeptical. The Pharisees questioned Jesus' power and authority. They claimed that it was only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow could possibly drive out demons. It was some sort of evil, dark, spiritual warfare. They refused to accept that Jesus might be the one who he said he was, that he might be the Son of God. And while some wondered if Jesus was the one they had, waited, had been waiting for, for these religious leaders, they refused to accept that he could possibly be. Jesus encourages them to take a look at the fruit, to examine the fruit from his ministry and from his life, and to judge for themselves, to see the good that has come as a sign that the kingdom of God is indeed here. But they continue to refuse to accept him. And so Jesus tells them a story. He gives them a warning, beginning, beginning in, we pick it up in verse 43, he says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes, to, goes through arid places seeking rest, and it does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house that I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Must not have any kids. <laughs> then it goes and it takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go and they live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. This is how it will be with this wicked generation. Now Jesus tells this story to them as a warning that what they choose to do with him matters, whether they choose to receive him or not. These religious scholars, well, they knew all the scriptures, right? They, they were the ones who, who knew the scriptures better than anyone else. They had spent their lives dedicated to studying the Hebrew scriptures and knowing the prophecies concerning the Messiah. And so if there's anyone who should recognize when the Messiah indeed does come, you would think it would be these guys, right? And everybody would turn and look and say, well, well what do you think? You know, is this indeed the one? And yet they refuse to accept Jesus. So when, how is it that when the Son of God stands in front of them, they can't see it, right? It's baffling to everyone else. And so Jesus warns them, he says, by choosing to reject what you've dedicated your lives to see, you're worse off than you were before. You see, what we choose to fill our space with matters, doesn't it? The religious leaders had prepared the house. They were careful to clean in every room. To, to live a spotless and blameless life, they were preparing themselves for what was to come. They focused on following the laws and, and knowing the scriptures, but they failed to fill their life with life-giving faith. They were complacent when it came to Jesus, and as a result, they were left empty inside. Complacency leaves us empty inside, doesn't it? It isn't enough to simply have the knowledge that we need. We need to believe in the things that we actually have come to know to be true. Right? It's not enough just to read the scripture and not really apply it to our lives. We need to, to believe it and put it into practice. We need to take the time to fill our lives with life-giving faith. 
the kind of faith that will sustain us. And when it comes to our relationships, I think Jesus' warning can speak to us as well. You see, what we choose to fill our relationships with, that relationship space matters, doesn't it? Do we believe the best about the other person when they fail to meet our expectations or when we are left disappointed? Or, or do we choose to believe the worst, filling our hearts with things like anger and bitterness and resentment and all the things that drain the life out of us? Complacency in our, our relationships leads us, and leaves us empty inside. Maybe you haven't necessarily left the relationship physically, but emotionally, <laughs> You're struggling, right? Maybe you haven't divorced your parents yet. You haven't moved out. You haven't taken your kids out of your estate plan or your will. But maybe, maybe it's been a while since you've really had the energy and the life and the care that you once had. You've checked out mentally. Maybe you've written others off. You, you've seen that coworker or that situation as, as hopeless. And so you wonder, things, you know, things will never change, so why do I even bother in the first place? I just need to get through this season, through this moment, and then I can move on. Then I will be free. But that isn't any kind of way to live our lives either. It drains us, it isolates us. Our complacency leaves us feeling empty inside, and that complacency is a dangerous place. Because it opens up the door for the evil one, doesn't it? That's when those self-doubts come. That's when the negativity comes. That's when we start to believe the worst about the other person. We allow that bitterness and that anger and that resentment to grow inside of us until our hearts become hard and we stop carrying it at all. It can be hard to see the progress we are making when we are in the middle of the ugly mountain. It's like all we can see is all the things that still need to get done. But we forget just about it how far we've come. But that doesn't mean we give up hope for the dream that we once had. So what will, you, what will you fill your relationship space with? Where will you find hope again? Well, it starts with one small repair at a time, doesn't it? If you haven't realized this yet, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. That person you are with, that person you're sitting next to, your brother, they're not perfect, all right? But before you get all confident, be careful. Because they're looking at you and they're seeing all your imperfections as well, right? The truth is we all have imperfections in our lives. We all have areas where we're not exactly perfect. The, the truth is we all can use a little touch-up. And you don't want to start that conversation by pointing out somebody else's faults. Trust me, that's a goal. <laughs> The reality is we all are broken people. What do I mean by that? Well, your life may not be in shambles, but we all have made our fair share of mistakes. We all have said things or done things that we might regret, things that have hurt the people that we love. Some of the relationships we value the most are sometimes taken for granted. And we all have a few things that we can work on in our lives to better honor and love one another. But if all we do is focus on the work that still needs to be done, then we're never going to see just how far we have come, just how far God has brought us. You see, it can be hard to see that progress when we are in the middle of our relationships. But it is important to pause and look to remember just how far we've come. Now, I've shared with you before that Melissa and I started seeing a counselor probably about seven years ago both individually and together as a couple. And looking back, we both were probably feeling that pressure of stress, stress of work, past trauma that we had endured, trying to raise three kids, four and under. Do you remember what that's like? Yeah, that's enough to bring anybody to go see a counselor. And even though we were in ministry together, we recognized that there was a lot of work still to be done that we were far from where we wanted to be. For me, to be honest, I was scared. You see, growing up, I sort of downplayed some of the trauma that I had experienced and seen as a child. The truth is, my father was abusive. And I have some vivid memories of 
times in which I was afraid, times in which I had seen and witnessed and experienced that kind of abuse, even before I could speak. By the time I was four years old, my mother made a courageous decision. She decided to leave my father and to file for divorce. And so as a young mother with three boys, she left that dangerous situation so that we could have a better future. Now, for most of my life, I thought that that decision alone was enough to spare me from carrying on that family cycle of abuse, something that probably had existed for generations in that family. And I thought, okay, that's, that's fine. I've been spared of that. I didn't have to experience that. I don't have to be like my father, right? But I'll never forget the first time that I felt it, the first time that I felt this, this anger towards another human being I had never experienced before. We were probably only home from our, our honeymoon for about one week. And who knows what the argument or what the trigger was. It might have been as something as silly as what side of the sink do you wash the dishes in, right? <laughs> you remember those early transitions? <laughs> Yeah, and who knows, it probably was nothing important, but suddenly we got to this point where we were so angry with one another. And I remember being scared. Because up to that point, I had never experienced it in that way. And I wondered where this came from, and I, and I, I had this fear that maybe I was more like my father than I realized. Well, we both managed to deal with our, our own struggles, probably in unhealthy ways. <laughs> But when that anger started overwhelming me when it came to my kids, then I knew this was a bigger problem that I couldn't handle on my own, that I needed some help. And I was even more afraid because I didn't want to be that guy. I didn't want to be that guy whose children were afraid of him because he got angry and lost his cool and yelled. I didn't want to be that guy who would grab or shake or hit or hurt a child. So I knew I needed to do something. I didn't want to carry on that cycle of abuse that probably occurred for generations. And, and you see my complacency about it, of just thinking, you know what, it's okay, I was spared from that, I don't have to be like that, I wasn't around it enough, I'm safe, right? My complacency up to that point left me hollow inside, left me empty inside, and allowed that anger that I wasn't even aware of to continue to grow. But I'm breaking that cycle today. I might not be perfect. I might still lose my cool. But I'm choosing to fill that space with something else. To get the help that I need to, to see a counselor to work on those things so that I can make a repair. And though it may have seemed like an impossible task, and though I may have wondered if I would ever get to where I wanted to be as a husband, as a father, as a human being, I can look back today and see the progress that I have made and the progress that I continue to make, one repair at a time. You see, we don't wake up one night and find that magically overnight, everything on our to-do list is completed. <laughs> we reach our goals, one repair at a time. We stay at it open. And as I worked through my growing list of projects this week, I couldn't help but feel like, oh man, it was so much easier before. It was so much easier in another place. And I suppose there's an element of truth to that, right? The previous home was 1,000 square feet less, less to maintain. I had an, asso uh, an association that took care of the exterior maintenance and mow the lawn. I didn't have to do those things and freed up other time to invest in other areas. But really the biggest difference, even though the house was only five years newer than our current one, was the fact that we were there from the beginning staying on top of the maintenance, staying on top of the needs, and making the improvements we wanted as we went along. And so when the carpet needed to be replaced, we did so one floor at a time. When a wall needed to be touched up, we did so one room at a time. When an appliance broke down, we either fixed it or we replaced it one appliance at a time so we didn't have to do everything at, at once. And it was easier to stay on top of those things and to stay on top of our goals, wasn't it, with that routine maintenance. I was able to stay on top of those repairs. 
And I think sometimes we forget this, don't we? We want instant results. We want everything to be done right now. I feel overwhelmed because I want everything on my list to have been done last month or last year, right? And there are things that I'm still working on since we moved into the house that I said, oh, I'm going to fix that someday. Some of you probably have spouses that have a someday list, right? From like the moment you got married or moved into the house. <laughs> right? And we want everything done in a, in a moment, in an instance. And sometimes we forget that it takes years of making repairs to get to the home that we were hoping for, to get to the house of our dreams again. And so we keep making progress one repair at a time because making a small repair now can lead to a better future, to big results in our future, doesn't it? Staying on top of that routine maintenance in our relationships is an investment worth making. In fact, I'll never forget a number of years ago when we were, were praying about and getting ready to start this church, we attended a, a church planting conference and had an opportunity to meet uh, pastor and author and speaker Rick Warren. And as Rick opened up about his own life, he shared with us how early on in his marriage, he realized just how, just how important counseling was. He, he said it was like, instead of seeing it as something that you need help, like, oh, you're so broken, he said, really, it was an investment. It was an investment in their happiness. It was an investment in their marriage to go and see someone and get the tools that they needed to continue to improve on their relationship. He, he described it as an investment in your success. For me, I see it as a great way to maintain healthy relationships in our lives. And one of the things that our counselor has taught us and has really stuck with us is how to go about making a repair. So how do you make a repair in a relationship, right? Well, first, we need to recognize the area that the, where the repair needs to be made, right? <laughs> Does it do any good if we don't see it? We need to identify the most pressing and urgent areas. What are the areas of our relationship that need the work right now, right? Like if the pipe burst in the master bath, you're not going to spend your time painting the living room. <laughs> you're going to have some other problems that you need to deal with first. And so first we, we start by identifying where is it that I need to make a repair right now. Second, it helps to communicate your intention. Literally using the phrase, can I make a repair? Or I would like to make a repair here is super helpful. One, it reminds me to stay focused on making a repair. Two, it kind of helps us let our guard down, right? When we know that at least the person values this relationship enough that they want to make a repair, they want to make things right. And so how can I let down my defensiveness enough to hear and receive what it is they are offering? Third, we take responsibility for what is ours Right? There are some things that we need to take responsibility for. Our actions, our inactions that may have hurt someone, the things we, we may have said, right, that may have caused harm. How we have contributed, recognizing how we might have contributed to the situation. And there are other things that we don't apologize for. You should never apologize for existing, right, for simply being. That's nothing we apologize for. You don't need to apologize for having a thought, or having an opinion, or seeing, or understanding things differently. And so it's important to recognize what is, it, what is ours to own here. Fourth, we ask for forgiveness. Right? We recognize that just because we ask for forgiveness doesn't mean forgiveness is granted. And there are some times where we will ask for forgiveness and that's all we can do. We can't force it, we can't force another person to forgive us. We simply request it and leave it with them. And then finally, we express our appreciation. We thank them for listening, for letting you share, for valuing the relationship enough to let you, uh, to allow an attempt of a repair to be made, to let them know that you love them and appreciate them, that you appreciate your relationship. And while not every repair goes smoothly, sometimes we do need to go back and make a touch up every now and then. Even a little repair can make a huge difference, can it? 
When we choose to make the repair, we are choosing to fill our lives with the example of the gospel. To fill our lives with God's grace. We fill our lives with the things that God desires for us. And we choose to fill our relationships with life and healing and hope. We all want to have relationships that will fill us, don't we? Rather than those that drain us. So what will you fill your relationship with? Because what we choose to fill that space with matters. Maybe you're here today, you're in the middle of what feels like a pretty messy remodel, right? A major overhaul. You are overwhelmed by all the work that still needs to be done. In fact, you've had a hard time listening to this message because you've been writing down, okay, we're going to get home, I need to cut the lawn yet, I need to take care of that tree, I need to, right? We've been thinking of all those things that we need to get done. But don't allow yourself to get so buried that you can't see and celebrate the progress that you have made and the work that God is doing in your life. Celebrate the small victories you have seen. Celebrate the repairs that you have made. For the way we restore the house of our dreams is by touching up one repair at a time. Let us pray. God, we, we first and foremost just Thank you for your grace, for your love and your mercy. Recognizing that we don't have to be perfect to come before you. That you have chosen to love us and accept us just as we are imperfect, broken, shattered, and all. God, take the pieces of our lives and restore them. Bring healing and hope and life to our lives and to our relationships again. And help us to live in such a way and honor one another in such a way that it brings honor and glory to you as well. Fill us with your grace. Fill us with your love. Watch over and protect us in the ones we care about. God, we ask that you continue to do this work. And Lord, if there's anyone here today just barely hanging on, we pray, Lord, that this would be a word of hope and encouragement to them. That as we pause, as we reflect, as we close with one final song of worship today, we'll be able to celebrate the victories. The small victories that we have seen or experienced in our lives, or even if we can't see those victories, we can celebrate the fact that you, Lord, are already victorious that you have fought the battle on our behalf, and that ultimately we have a victory in you because of what you have done. So we thank you for this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite our worship team to come and, and share. And as we close our service today, I just invite you to, to speak some reflection. Is there an area of your life that God wants to do some work? Is there a touch-up that needs to be done? Have you struggled with that endless list? Wondering just how far have I actually come? Wondering will I ever get there? If so, may this song be a song that brings us hope as we remember that the battle belongs to the Lord. We invite you to stand as we close.